This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome or welcome back to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist and I've lived and worked in Fayetteville, Arkansas for almost 30 years. I started this podcast over five years ago because I wanted to extend the walls of my practice to those of you who might already be very interested in psychological or emotional issues, to those of you who might have just been diagnosed with something or you're looking for some kind of answers, but also to those of you, a third group, who might think therapy is just for the birds and you really don't understand why people even spend the money on it and take the time for it. Maybe you think it's pretty idiotic, but you're just sad enough or unhappy enough or curious enough to listen to someone like me on self-work. It's not therapy, but at least it can give you some ideas of what therapy might be like. So welcome to all of you. One of the hardest, even most cruel things about depression is the very darkness of your thoughts, the hounding of your mind and heart with feelings that seem to have the power at times to wipe all rationale from your consciousness and bury you with shame, worthlessness, distrust, and complete disbelief that anything might ever change. You'll never feel better. Fighting through, trying to use a mind that's already fatigued and foggy, and it can seem that ruminations and obsessions are trying to destroy any hope you might have. So today, we're going to talk about those vicious lies that depression tries to convince you of. As always, I will focus on what you can do about it to help you fight this battle and maybe even overcome it. The listener email is from someone whose therapist, with whom she'd been working for over five years, terminated their work together because of retirement. The issue seems to be that she let people know only a couple of months before she stopped doing therapy. Now the patient is asking, why should I do this again? Why should I go to therapy again? This hurts too much. So I'll try to help her with those questions and that grief. Today's episode is sponsored by BetterHelp, and I'm happy to say that they've been a sponsor of Self Work Now for two years, and many of you have written to me that their services have been more than helpful. Virtual therapy has become pretty normal now during the pandemic, and BetterHelp offers many ways for you to get therapy conveniently and easily, while also doing the important work you may need to do. But today, let's talk about severe depression's lies, or even moderate depression's lies, and of course what you can do about it when you hear them. We're headed into Mental Health Month here in the U.S. in May, which is a wonderful time for websites and podcasts and social media influencers, magazines, and newspapers to run articles and interview people who deal with mental illness and to raise awareness. And it's a great thing. But every month is Mental Health Awareness Month here at Self Work. So this week, I'm going to focus on the lies that your depressed mind will tell you. But first, I want to read what I thought was an incredibly eloquent description of the illness itself and how what it's called, depression, doesn't do it justice. I'm quoting William Styron, an American novelist who was 60 when he had his first diagnosed episode of severe depression, which is kind of unusual. He was famous for the books The Confessions of Nat Turner, Lie Down in Darkness, and perhaps most famous for Sophie's Choice. But his memoir, Darkness Visible, came out in 1990 as he told all about his experience with depression. This is from an article he wrote in Vanity Fair, and I have the entire article in the show notes, and I want to tell you, it's definitely worth reading. I've pulled three excerpts from it, and so here I quote. The pain of severe depression is quite unimaginable to those who have not suffered it, and it kills in many instances because its anguish can no longer be borne. The prevention of many suicides will continue to be hindered until there is a general awareness of the nature of this pain. Through the healing process of time and through medical intervention or hospitalization in many cases, most people survive depression, which may be its only blessing. But to the tragic legion who are compelled to destroy themselves, there should be no more reproof attached than to victims of terminal cancer. 
When I was first aware that I'd been laid low by the disease, I felt a need, among other things, to register a strong protest against the word depression. Depression, most people know, used to be termed melancholia, a word which appeared in English as early as the year 1303 and crops up more than once in Chaucer who in his usage seemed to be aware of its pathological nuances. Melancholia would still appear to be a far more apt and evocative word for the blacker forms of this disorder. Brainstorm, for instance, has unfortunately been preempted to describe somewhat jocularly intellectual inspiration, but something along these lines is needed. Told that someone's mood disorder had evolved into a storm, a veritable howling tempest in the brain, which is indeed what a clinical depression resembles like nothing else. Even the uninformed layman might display sympathy rather than the standard reaction that depression evokes, something akin to, so what, or you'll pull out of it, or we all have bad days. The phrase nervous breakdown seems to be on its way out, certainly deservedly so, owing to its insinuation of a vague spinelessness. But we still seem destined to be saddled with depression until a better, sturdier name is created. (laughs) Well, I wish I could write like that. I actually quite like the term brainstorm for what happens with severe depression, a veritable howling tempest in the brain. Now, I've not experienced severe depression myself, But many times I've looked into the eyes of someone who's struggling with it, only to see confusion, apathy, forlornness, hopelessness, anger, fear. And sometimes what's even worse in many ways, I see nothing in their eyes. Emptiness. The light is gone. Now let's make it clear that these lies we're talking about are not actual voices in your head. You're not having auditory hallucinations, which can be a part of a severe depression, but that's not what we're talking about today. Having those kinds of hallucinations is what is called psychosis, when you cannot differentiate what is real and what is not. You truly hear voices inside your head, or you see things that aren't there, that's visual hallucination, and you can become psychotic with depression, bipolar disorder, and if it happens, it requires different treatment. What I'm talking about today, the voices, or the lies your depression tells you, is really the obsessing or ruminating around a negative or painful theme or belief about yourself. And those ruminations are times when you struggle to get thoughts out of your head, like they're whirring around in that tempest Styron talked about, your own self-tormenting tornado, and your body, mind, heart, and soul are affected. I found a great website that I'd never seen from the UK called Blurt that offers people with depression support and education and help. Again, I've got their Instagram URL in the show notes. The team wrote this article, which was the best I could find about these lies. And as usual, I'll use some of their major points and have the article ready for you to read. But I'm also going to, of course, wax eloquent about my own ideas. So there are eight lies that we're going to focus on. Number one, depression tries to convince you that you're not actually ill. You know, some say that depression is invisible, and since it can't be seen like a rash or broken bone on an x-ray or measured like a fever, it must not exist. It's a mood or a bad day or something you're supposed to be able to shake off. And there's also something about the fact that your very mind is affected. And your mind is you, right? Then if your mind is you, your choices, your emotions, your thoughts, then how can your thoughts have an illness? There's a lot of resistance to that. I don't want to think of depression as an illness. My mind is fine, thank you. I don't have an ill personality or an ill mind, but that's actually denial talking because it's too threatening to think. Perhaps your thinking can be irrational. Your emotions can be under or overly reactive. Your mood could have a will of its own. It can seem to ebb and flow and get happy and get sad quite without any kind of reason or rationale. This is what you can do about it. You have to have the bravery to say, I'm not me right now, and that's hard. And then weirdly and contradictorily, Your very depression will lie to you and say, there's nothing wrong with you, when there is. Number two, depression tells you that everything is your fault. Depression will scream at you that all things are your fault. It's like an abusive partner who turns the most minute and random things 
into big deals and screams at you, so what did you do now to make this happen? How often do you say, I'm sorry, when you haven't caused anything to happen? You're simply accustomed and your depression tells you that everything from your alternator going out on your car to your kid making a D on a test to someone at work harassing you, all of that is somehow your fault. That's depression's lies. So you have to struggle against this. You have to work to become aware of what, in reality, you're in control of, and thus have some responsibility for, but also what you don't have control over, and had nothing to do with it happening. To make this point in my office, there's a stop sign right outside my office window, and sometimes when I have a patient who blames themselves for everything, I'll say, so if you saw a car run that stop sign and maybe even hit a pedestrian, would that be your fault? Sometimes, believe it or not, they'll say, well, you know, I could have raced out onto that porch and yelled at the person to get out of the way. So I'll say, but that means you could have predicted that was going to happen, and you couldn't move like Superman. No, but I could have acted. So you're saying to me that because you saw it, you're saying that you're at fault. Well, sort of. But then they begin to realize and smile. They realize the absurdity of what they're saying. Yes, it has happened. Yes, they saw it happen, but there was very little and really nothing they could have done to prevent it. And then what we do is we begin looking at things in their lives that depression is telling them is their fault and begin to dismantle that belief bit by bit, just like we did running the stop sign. Of course, it takes integrity to take responsibility for what you actually have control over. Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you forgot something. Maybe you did too much. It could be many things. But you have to tell that depressed voice to be quiet when you had no control over it happening. It's not your fault. So before we get to the next six depression lies, let's hear a quick message from BetterHelp, who wants to help you challenge those lies, too. BetterHelp has been a sponsor of Self Work for at least a year or more, and I'm so glad to have them on board. BetterHelp isn't a crisis line, and it's not self-help. It's actual professional therapy online. And as I've done much more virtual work during the pandemic, I've seen firsthand how effective and convenient virtual work is. When you contact BetterHelp, you'll get a response from a licensed therapist in as little as 48 hours. And they'll make sure you feel your therapist is a wonderful match for you. I, of course, tried this, and I was impressed with the therapist they presented to me as well as what the therapists themselves offered. And BetterHelp and I want 2022 to be your most mentally healthy year ever. So just visit betterhelp.com slash self-work and you'll get a special offer to get 10% off your first month of BetterHelp. Again, that's betterhelp.com slash self-work. Hope you'll give it a try, especially getting 2022 off to a great start. Again, I want to thank Blurt for providing an outline of these lies that depression repeats over and over. I haven't used all of theirs. I combined a couple of them because I only have 25 minutes for this podcast. (laughs) Number three is depression tells you that nobody cares about you or likes you. My ex-husband used to say to me, you better stay with me because if anyone knew the real you, they'd leave you. He was my own voice of depression. Now, depression can tell you something very similar, that no one is really going to care for you. And even if they do, they're probably just feeling sorry for you. Depression will even tell you that you're invisible to others. So what can you do about this lie? Again, you can look for the original source of where you came to believe this. Who has said that or acted like that in your past? And is it helpful to believe it? Or does it keep you isolated? And if you isolate yourself, you can't challenge that lie. There may be some people who don't like you, but everybody or nobody cares about you. You can hear the very black and whiteness of that thought. And again, if someone screams that at you or someone whispered it to you or depression is still whispering it to you, you have to challenge your belief in it. Number four is depression tells you that you're not good enough. Those of you who've listened to Self Work know about my passion to get the word out about depression that's camouflaged by the perfect looking life. I call it perfectly hidden depression or trauma based perfectionism. 
Certainly in Perfectly Hidden Depression, as in other modes of depression, the voice of shame, the voice that says you'll never be good enough, that you'll never do anything important enough to warrant you even being alive, that voice can be so strong. Sometimes that voice comes from your past. It's your father or mother screaming at you. It's a coach or a teacher. It's shame that comes from being abused, and you say, I must not be smart enough or pretty enough or important enough to matter. I'm not good enough. But there is no truth in that. What do you do about it? How do you go about trying to change it? You develop compassion for yourself. You have to know that, yes, you have vulnerabilities. You have made and will make mistakes. But those mistakes, those fumbles, don't define you. They don't make you not good. You have to be as kind to yourself as you have the ability to be to others. Number five, depression tells you that you don't deserve things because you're bad. Here's a lie that's tied in with your worth. You don't deserve good things, but you do deserve bad things. Because you're not important or you don't have the talents others have. You don't deserve anything good coming your way. Another lie that belongs with this is that you always have to earn everything you receive. Now think about that for a minute. Do you really have to earn everything you receive? No, you don't. You deserve kindness and caring, not because you earn it, but because you exist. So many children are raised to believe that even the most basic good things have to be earned, usually by doing what a parent tells you to do. But an abusive parent, even when the good thing is earned, even when standards are met, that abusive parent can withhold what was promised. And thus, you learn that no matter what you do, you don't deserve good things happening, that no amount of earning works for you, so you must be worthless, you must be bad, you should be punished, and your depression will do that. It will punish you by saying you don't deserve it, you don't deserve things because you're bad, and that is a lie. Yes, there are certainly things in life that you set your sights on and work hard to accomplish. But your very worth is not one of those things. Your worth is intrinsic to your very being. And that is a mantra you can begin to tell yourself daily, hourly if you need to, to dispel this vicious lie of depression. Number six, depression tells you to be quiet and to hide. So much of my work with people with depression is to remind them that their voice, their perspective has merit that your true voice is important to hear. But your depression will try to convince you otherwise. You know you're never right. No one cares about your opinion. You sound stupid. Finding your voice is a way to challenge that lie. And how do you do that? You first begin with people you trust, or just one person, and risk saying what you think or feel or believe. You can say things like, from my perspective, I think that, or... What I've noticed is, again, you're not touting that you know the truth. You're simply voicing your perspective. (laughs) I had to laugh when I remembered this example. One of my best girlfriends in high school, we had this place called Teen Town where we all danced. She noticed that I was a very shy dancer, so I copied the person next to me rather than dance my own dance. One day, she said, with some kindness, but also she liked to... uh, be very sarcastic with me. She said, do you realize you look sillier doing that than you would if you just danced the way you know how to dance? (laughs) It was a great lesson in risking to me to find my dance, but also to find my voice. Number seven is depression tells you that you're a burden. Your cousin who's diabetic isn't innately a burden. Your mom who's fighting cancer isn't a drag on everyone. Your depression will lie and tell you that because you fight depression, you're a burden. Other people are wasting their time caring about you or for you. You know, a couple of my best friends have mood disorders. And you know, I've talked about it, I have panic attacks from time to time. Does that make them or me a burden? No. Just like if I needed to help a diabetic friend from time to time find some orange juice, or if I drove my mom to her cancer treatment, that's not a drag. That's helping. That's loving. Your depression may give others a chance to offer you help. In fact, that happened to me just this week. 
my cousin and I are trying to get together, and I had a horrible panic attack several years ago on the highway, and I'm still a little nervous on the expressway. She said, hey, let's just meet halfway. Go as far as you can comfortably, and I'll come get you. I'm not a burden. She's helping me, and that's what we do when we care. And you can, of course, give that kind of caring in return. Here's number eight. Depression tells you that there's no hope. Hopelessness is very tied in with a voice of depression. Not only is it a symptom of depression, but the lie can tell you you'll never feel any better. Even if you felt much better in the past, your depression can tell you that you'll never find a way out. And even suicide can seem like a viable option. Terry Cheney, who I interviewed about her lifelong fight with bipolar disorder, had a great idea to combat this voice of hopelessness. I interviewed her, gosh, quite a long time ago, but I'll include her interview in the show notes. She's very wise. She'd write down the lies her depression would tell her when she was depressed, when she was low with her bipolar, and then the lies her mania would tell her. Some of them were funny, like, it's really not a good idea to sleep with the person you've just met and stuff like that. And then she'd keep those lists where she could see them whenever she needed them. And she would write at the top of the page, don't believe this, it's not true, it's your mania talking, it's your depression talking, and it will change. What's also exciting is that new treatments are always being created, and some, like TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, are making huge changes in people's lives who deal with chronic depression. I've seen it work very well. I'm going to do a little YGTG on transcranial magnetic stimulation soon, so look for that. But the major message I want to tell you is you matter no matter what your depression lies to you about. You are loved for that very same reason, but you have to work on challenging those lies. There's something you can do about it, and you will free yourself from those lies. Maybe not every day, maybe some days will be harder than others, but if you know depression lies, you don't have to listen to it. You don't have to believe them. The listener email from today was from someone who I thought had a very unique perspective on her therapist leaving treatment. She says, Dr. Rutherford, I've been working with my therapist for the past five years or so, often weekly sessions. She recently retired, giving, in my opinion, a rather short notice. I later learned that it was about two months. Of all the articles and podcasts one can find about therapy, the feelings of the client when the therapist terminates doesn't seem to be talked about often. I am struggling. Grief, and I have a lot of shame and embarrassment feeling this way. Maybe my adjustment disorder that brought me into therapy in the first place isn't helping. I think clients entering therapy should be made aware that exiting therapy could be just as hard. She gave me a referral to a new therapist, but it seems pretty stupid that I would do this again. I became too attached. Any thoughts? So here was my answer. Ideally, this therapist didn't give her patients a lot of time to anticipate the grief of therapy ending, especially because it ended not of their own accord or that they'd been healed. She made a decision to retire. Of course, there may have been circumstances that she didn't share about why her choice was so quick. But you don't know. She just decided to retire from your perspective. So I think the grief is, of course, about the relationship ending, but also because it didn't end in a celebratory way or the way that you chose. So that can cause abandonment and confusion. You say that maybe you got too attached. I think often when you are in therapy with someone for that long a period of time, that kind of deeper attachment is very normal. And again, I'm not sure why the therapist made the choice that they did, but I do agree with you that it was short. But your question of, I'm not sure I should do this again, is interesting, and I'm I'm reminded of when people lose a pet, and their grief is horrific. Some say they'll never get another pet, and others are at the store the next week. I'm not comparing pets with therapists, don't get me wrong, but hopefully you get my drift. Your reaction is more of the first kind, I don't think I could ever do this again, and it's a common one. So here's my suggestion, again, we're always talking about what you can do about it. Rather than not going back to therapy, I'd make sure and talk with a potential therapist about the hurt that you just went through. I've counseled several people through the years that either have been sexually abused by a therapist or that therapist has breached some kind of very important boundary and was highly unethical. 
And it, of course, takes them a while to heal. But that becomes the work of that therapy. Before you ever go into anything else, particularly in detail, about what your past work has been about, that's the work you do. Maybe you can go on without therapy at that point, or if you've gained trust again, then perhaps you'd want to see if there is remaining work to be done. But you've given the therapist a heads up, hey, this will really hurt me if this happens again. So hopefully that's helpful to you. Thank you so much for writing in. Thank you so much for being here. I want to thank Probably Anxious was the title she gave herself. She says, I recently discovered this podcast just by searching depression and anxiety. I just love Dr. Rutherford. Thank you so much. Her podcasts are like little snippets in a mental health. She does a great job at identifying terms and helps you better understand different diagnoses. She uses a practical approach and uses examples now that all can relate to. It's an easy listen if you're on your own self-work. You see, I love those reviews because I get to know exactly what y'all like, but you don't like what you do like. You want me to talk about these things in detail and give you very common sense explanations of it, and actually, it's my favorite thing to do too, so thank you so much, probably anxious, for, for that review on Apple Podcasts. Also, I've gotten several new ratings for my book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, and I so appreciate that. Perfectly Hidden Depression is a book that contains over 60 exercises that will help you begin to recognize how frightened you are of losing control of your emotions and that actually you have memories that you have hid from and stored away for so long. It's You've acted like you're just fine all the time and you have this perfect life when really you have some inward despair and loneliness. So even if you don't think you're a perfectionist, you might want to pick up this book. It's an ebook, it's an audio book, and I so appreciate the new ratings. I've gotten several this week. Thank you. We're growing by leaps and bounds here at Self Work, so I know that's because you're telling your friends and family or loved ones about listening to Self Work. And I'm so very, very, very grateful. I'd love for you to join me over to Instagram at Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I do sometimes Instagram lives and I love talking to people and, you know, actually being able to in real time to answer questions. That's a lot of fun. And also I have a Facebook closed group at facebook.com slash groups slash self work. Love to have you over there as well. Again, my gratitude for you being here. Take very good care of you, of your loved ones, and of your community. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been self-work.